Corinthians chapter 9. I appreciate you watching today, and I hope it's a blessing to you. I would like to recommend that you get a pencil and a piece of paper and get your Bible down <clears throat> and write the scripture references down and study them uh, for yourself. Our aim is to show you that Jesus Christ is the only Savior that God Almighty has offered to men and that the salvation that is in Christ is based upon not him as being the king of Israel, but it's based upon the fact that he died for your sins and that he was buried and he rose again. And that salvation is free now based upon the work that he did for you at Calvary, not upon any work that you could do for him now. <clears throat> We also uh, have the aim in mind to make all men to see the fellowship of the mystery. It doesn't make any difference who you are, where you've been, what you were doing while you were there. It doesn't make any difference about your moral condition. God Almighty can save you today due to the fact that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and so your trespasses were imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. God Almighty poured out his wrath upon your sins at Calvary so that you, by simple faith in him, by trusting him, believing in the work that he did for you, believing that he died for your sins, that God Almighty can save you. <clears throat> you can come to God through Jesus Christ, no other way. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, would you read with me from verse 16, Paul said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 17, For if I do this thing, <clears throat> reference to preaching the gospel, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. In other words, whether Paul preached it willingly or not, he was given a dispensation of the gospel. Turn please to Colossians and compare in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, Will you read with me from the very latter part of verse 23? Colossians 1, verse 23, the latter part says, I, Paul, am made a minister, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. You understand that Paul suffered for the church. Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus Christ paid for our sins. But for that truth to get to us, Someone had to suffer. God chose the Apostle Paul to do that, and so Paul suffered wherever he went for preaching the gospel. And if we do it today, if we preach the gospel of Christ, we're going to condemn men who believe that they can work for their salvation. Any day that you preach salvation by grace through faith without any form of works, somebody is going to get angry at you somebody's going to be mad at you. And the Bible said, them that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you <clears throat> to fulfill the word of God. Well then, there was a gap in history. If I take the book of Daniel and I read Daniel chapter 9, I find that the angel Gabriel told Daniel about a period of time that was determined upon the city of Jerusalem and the temple and so forth and the people of Israel. There was a specific, definite period of time that was determined upon them. That time began with the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And it went unto 
Messiah, the Prince. In other words, those at the first coming of Christ should have been able to have known who he was because they could have looked in Daniel chapter 9 and have determined from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, they would have determined the time that Jesus Christ is going to come. <clears throat> it's given back there. And he says then that Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and on and on he goes. And then he, that prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In other words, then for seven years in our future, time was laid out in the Bible. <clears throat> the angel Gabriel told Daniel about the time from the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem through Nehemiah and Ezra. From that time unto the cutting off of Messiah, he tells him a specific period of time. And then he tells him about another seven year period in the future over here. People call it the last week of Daniel 9 and such things as that. But nevertheless, it's over there. So then in history, in the Bible, we have recorded time up to the crucifixion of Christ. We have recorded time from the appearing of the Antichrist through the second coming of Christ. But we do not have that time recorded from the crucifixion to the Antichrist. Uh, so Paul said that he was given to fulfill the Word of God. When Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ is God's prophet. In Matthew chapter 13, the prophet of God, Jesus Christ, the prophet, as in Deuteronomy chapter 15, as Deuteronomy chapter 18, God's prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, prophesied of time after the cross of Christ. And the angel Gabriel told Daniel about the time up to the cross. Christ, the prophet of God, in Matthew 13, told of the time immediately after the cross. But there was still a gap. There was still a period of time in here that God's clock with the Gentiles would record that wasn't in the Bible. It was a time when Israel would be scattered among the nations. It was a time when they would be not God's people. It was a time when they would be the tail of the nations, not the head. It was a time when they would be underneath and not above, and on and on, as in Exodus chapter 19, as in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and numerous other passages of Scripture. So God Almighty saved Saul of Tarsus. His name was changed to Paul. He appeared unto him in Acts chapter 9. And God Almighty gave him the gospel and a dispensation of the gospel to fulfill the word of God. In other words, his writings fill up the scriptures. His writings complete the scriptures. Now, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, Verse 25, For if I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me for you to fulfill the word of God. Well, then the apostle Paul fulfilled the word of God for you Gentiles. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews didn't write to you directly. He wrote to Hebrews. James didn't write to you directly. He wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. First and second Peter is not written to you, it's written to a nation that was formed by the preaching back here in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5. And on and on it goes. Those epistles are for our admonition and learning, but they're not directed to us as members of the body of Christ. Paul filled up the word of God for you Gentiles. 
you want to be saved? Where would you go to find salvation for a Gentile in this age? You'd find it in Romans through Philemon. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is given the gospel for the Gentiles. Paul is the preacher and the teacher to the Gentiles. He's given the dispensation under the Gentiles. Where else would you look? Well, I'd look in Paul's epistles. All right, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, even the mystery. In other words, Paul's epistles then are about a mystery. They are a mystery to people. People did not understand them and still don't. They still remain a mystery to the church. The church don't know anything about Romans through Philemon anymore. They claim to know about Matthew. They claim to know about Acts. They claim to know about 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They claim to know about the Hebrew epistles, but they don't know anything about Paul's epistles. Talk to them about Paul's epistles and they'll get mad at you. Talk to them about following the apostle Paul and then sarcastically they say, I believe in following Jesus myself. Well, that's their problem. God Almighty gave them an apostle. His name is Paul. God Almighty sent them a minister according to Romans chapter 15. His name is Paul. God sent them a preacher and a teacher. His name is Paul. Where would I find salvation for a Gentile? I'd find it in Paul's epistles. It was given unto Paul to fulfill the word of God for you Gentiles, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints. What is the real mystery in here? It's Christ in the Gentiles, the hope of glory. You see, we had no hope. According to, Philipp, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, the Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. God Almighty never promised back here. He never prophesied back here that he'd send anybody to the Gentiles while Israel was out of covenant relationship with him. God never made those promises. Therefore, it left us without hope and without God in the world. But the hope of the Gentiles is made clear in Paul's epistles. What is your hope today? Christ in you, the hope of glory. How can you get out of this world? You can't get out of this world alive unless Christ be in you. And Christ cannot be in you unless you believe that he died for your sins at Calvary, was buried and rose again. If you believe that Jesus Christ is going to help you to work for your salvation, then you're lost. Who is saved? Those that quit trying. Those that stop working for their salvation. They stop trying to be a Christian. They surrender under the Lord. They give in. And they, as it were, turn to the Lord by faith, as if to say, unless you save my soul, I'll go to hell. They turn their case over to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Jesus Christ and Him alone as their Savior. The Lord's not going to help you save yourself. If you did, you brag about it. You that trying to save yourself, now you brag about it. Well, stop boasting and turn your salvation over to the Lord and give him the credit for your salvation. Now, we started last week, we were talking last week about the appearing of the Lord to the Apostle Paul. That appearing was in one accord with that which God Almighty determined before the foundation of the world we found that he's going to appear again, as in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to a judgment at that time. Paul said that he was going to receive a crown of righteousness. Why? Because that he had finished his course, kept the faith, fought a good fight, on and on. So he's going to receive a crown of righteousness. So our preaching and our teaching is between the two, two appearings of the Lord when he appeared to Paul, the message of grace came down. The grace of God saves men in this age. Those that are saved by grace through faith go up at that next appearing of the Lord. When he shall appear, our vile bodies are going to be changed, made like unto his glorious body. 
we're going up to meet him, and on and on. Now, I want you to notice something in comparison. Now, this is what the Bible says for us to do. The Bible says that we ought to compare spiritual things with spiritual to get the truth, so let's do that. I want you to turn with me, please, with one hand to Galatians chapter 1. With the other hand, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Galatians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to notice the gospel committed to the apostle Paul as compared to this over here. In Galatians chapter 1, notice in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, then somebody was preaching a perverted gospel unto the Galatians. Verse 8, and what, by the way, what was that perverted gospel? They were teaching them to believe in Jesus Christ and keep the law believe in Jesus Christ and work for their salvation. But in Galatians, Paul said that if you be circumcised or if you be under the law and so forth, you're fallen from grace. People today preach that if you sin, you fall from grace. You couldn't be farther from the truth. The truth in the context, the only place in the Bible pertaining to falling from grace is in Galatians chapter 5, read it and see. How did they fall from grace? By believing in keeping the law to be saved. If you believe in keeping the commandments to be saved, you're fallen from grace. Quit pointing an accusing finger at some, what you call an immoral person out there. If you're trying to save your soul by your own works, you're immoral. The most morally perfect thing you could do would be to stop trying and start trusting the Lord. If you believe in trusting Christ and working for your salvation, you've got a perverted gospel. In verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Do you see that? Anybody that preaches unto you believe in Jesus Christ and keep the law, according to the passage, is accursed. In other words, those that believe in trust in Christ and keeping the law aren't saved. They're cursed. They're not saved. Uh, verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, lest somebody should have missed it. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than you've received, let him be accursed. For I do, not, uh, do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the apostles did not teach the gospel to Paul. Peter, James, and John didn't preach the gospel of the apostle Paul. He didn't receive it from man. He received it directly by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. That happened in Acts chapter 9 when the Lord appeared to the apostle Paul and he records the message in 1 in, uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Very clearly he said, The gospel I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, look in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the words spoken by angels, and that was in the giving of the law back at Mount Sinai, if the words spoken by angels were steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we, notice the writer, we, Whoever we is, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now that cannot be the Apostle Paul. How do I know that? Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. I neither received it, the gospel he preached, of man, 
neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Paul did not get his message by confirmation from those that heard the Lord. Paul got his message directly from glory, directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the book of Hebrews cannot be one of Paul's epistles. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is not Paul. Say, who wrote it? I don't know. Doesn't matter. It's written to Hebrews after the completion of the church, which is the body of Christ. But that isn't all. Let's notice the one body Paul refers to. So take Hebrews chapter 3 and take 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 3. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, notice in verse 12, Paul said, For as the body, that will be the human body, is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born to free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now, we that believe in Christ, trusting that He died for our sins, we that believe the Gospel of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, have been baptized into the body of Christ. Notice in verse 18, But now if God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. You that I'm talking to, that have trusted Christ, you that believe that he paid for all your sins, and you're not trusting in your works to save you, you're trusting what he did at Calvary and that alone to save you. You have been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. You're a partaker of Christ. You're one with the other members in his body. God has set you in the body as it has pleased him. It's finished, it's complete, and you had nothing to do with it except believe it in Christ as your Savior, trusting his death at Calvary to pay for your sins. But look at the Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews chapter 3, notice we'll start in verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which should be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we Condition: If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Now come to verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. There is no possible way that anybody that can read sixth grade English can apply that verse today and make it stand. Why? Why, beloved, we are already partakers of Christ. We partook of Christ by looking back to the cross and believing that he paid for our sins. He died for us at Calvary. And the Holy Spirit has baptized us into the one body. God has placed us in the body as it pleased him. We now make up the body of Christ. We are partakers of Christ. And yet, whoever these people are, and they're called Hebrews, they cannot be a partaker of Christ without enduring to the end. The end has to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The deliverer shall roll out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is God's covenant unto them when he shall take away their sins. In other words, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're baptized, as in Acts chapter 2, looking unto remission of sins. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, P 
Peter says unto them, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of oppression shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. This is clear. The Hebrews that are written to in the letter are going to continue to believe in Jesus while they keep the law, while they keep the commandments, enduring to the end, enduring unto the day when the Deliverer shall roar out of Zion. When Jesus Christ shall come again and turn away ungodliness from Jacob, that is God's covenant unto them when he shall take away their sins. This is clear in Zechariah chapter 12 and Zechariah chapter 13. In Zechariah chapter 13, context, coming of the Lord. Zechariah 13, in that day there shall be a fountain open unto them for sin and for uncleanness. In other words, the fountain of blood will be open to the Hebrews at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they cannot be partakers of Christ unless they endure unto them. They've got to endure the Antichrist. They've got to resist the mark of the beast and the number of his name, and on and on. You, you don't have to resist anything. All you have to do is trust Christ for salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and what he did for you at Calvary. There is no way that you can say that he's saying the same thing in Romans through Philemon that he's saying over here and believe the Bible. But that isn't all. Let's try again. Look in Romans chapter 8. Take Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6 and Romans chapter 8. All right, in Romans chapter 8, what does the Bible say to those that are saved in this age? In Romans 8, notice in verse uh, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, and on and on and on? He says no way. In verse 30, uh, 31, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? In verse 34, who is he that condemneth? No one can. And yet in Hebrews chapter 6, and because of my time, I recommend that you read Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 6. And notice that these people, if they fall away, cannot be renewed again unto repentance. They must endure to the end. They are not sealed unto the day of redemption as we are. We that have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, believing that he died for us at Calvary, are sealed, we're put in the body of Christ, and nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou too shalt be saved. Thank you for listening today. Until next week, good day. Grace Believers Bible Study is sponsored by the Bereavement.